We will start session C5. The title of this session is The Digital Era Rebuilding the Ecosystem of Work Learning Life for Well Being. Due to the Industry 4.0 digital transition and COVID-19, many changes are taking place in the world of occupations, vocational education and training, as well as the concept of work evolving toward self-realization and self-development. In this session, we will talk about vocational training to recreate the ecosystem in which work, learning, and life all form a balance. In this session, we have Professor Lee Jung-dong serving as moderator, and the speakers will be Professor Emeritus Peter Kuching, as well as Mr. Henry Stewart, CE Chief Happiness Officer of Happy Limited, as well as Professor Chang wan Sub of Yonsei University. Please welcome them with a big hand. Good morning. My name is Chong dong Lee. The topic of session C5 is the digital era rebuilding the ecosystem of work learning life for well-being. We have three distinguished speakers who each will present on an important aspect of the topic of striking the right balance between work, learning and life. They will provide us with important keywords, food for thought. Since the, since the MC has already announced the titles and names and affiliations of the speakers, I will not do so again. Please refer to the booklets for further information. In COVID-19, the non-face-to-face -face work environment is going through changes, and at the same time, there is a thirst for the improvement in the offline work environment. Regarding this issue of whether to go online or offline, there is a generational gap in terms of reception. The young generation feel that online work can help promote the balance between work, learning, and life, whereas the older generation feels that, well, if you're working for a company, you have to sit side by side with the people you work with. As well as the question of what type of or method of work you will adopt, there's also the issue of how an individual can achieve more success in their lives and to that end, how to have access to and acquire the relevant competencies. These are important questions that we keep asking ourselves. Rather than my going on further, I think our time will be better spent listening to our distinguished speakers and their insights. So we will invite Professor Peter Kuching, who is joining us online. Professor Emeritus, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Peter, please. Yeah. Peter, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. The microphone is yours. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Haseo. Good morning to you in Korea and wherever you are uh, connecting from to our session. The Global HR Forum is such an important event for the country, for the region, and I think for the world and the globe at large. And it's no coincidence that two of the most important meetings, the one on climate change in Glasgow and the Global HR Forum are happening roughly about the same time. Both focus on sustainability in various aspects. So I'm very pleased to be here with you and share some of my thoughts on the changing connections, the changing relationship between self and work. I call it changing landscapes and opportunities in the digital era. I know that with a very large conference like this, there tend to be uh, alumni and graduates from the University of Illinois 
And so a shout out to the graduates from Korea over the years. We've had so many talented and highly motivated students from Korea go through our graduate programs. Many of them have turned to Korea and are now leading leaders in academia, in business and industry and in government. So as a little reminder, I share with you the uh, image of the central square, the quad of the University of, of Illinois. When this meeting was scheduled, I had hoped, of course, to meet in person at well, the wonderful conference facility at, at Walker Hill, which I know quite, quite well. But the COVID crisis presents not only danger, but also an opportunity. And I think if there's something that we have learned over the past years is the power the power of the digital era, the power of being able to learn, to develop, to work, to connect at a distance. It's a tremendous opportunity to shape and reshape work, career, and other forms of, of our lives. About 10 years ago, I was invited to speak at the Global HR Conference in 2011, and I spoke about the protean career, the self-directed career, the career that's at the discretion and under the control of the individual rather than an HR department in a corporation. And then important as the topic was then, we talked a lot about the conditions that would enable somebody to start a self-directed career. I think the opportunities that COVID brought upon us and the digital area have broadened opportunities and actually the number and quantity of self-directed career behavior. In the United States, many, many individuals have left corporate America, have left their organizations, and have started their own businesses. Some because of necessity, they might have been laid off. Others because they looked for a better balance between self, between their personal lives, their personal preferences and priorities, and work. And the digital era has resulted in a sea change, in a very, very dramatic shift in the opportunities and availability of working at a distance, of working part-time, of working from home, of doing what we call gig work, that is working on small projects for one employer, for one customer or another, and in general to work as an entrepreneur to create the kind of work condition and the kind of balance between work and life that one wants. So whether out of necessity or out of volition, out of free will, people began to craft their own careers in the past two years to an extent that is largely unheard before. Now, if the digital era works for individuals, they also offer opportunities for organizations. Organizations can now acquire talent, develop talent, network with colleagues and others to a degree that was not heard before, unbound by space and time zone. So... I was very pleased that the focus of this session is on the need for a shift in paradigm of working and learning. And yesterday in the many excellent presentations that I gleaned from the, uh, the program, and today, this morning and later today, you've heard a lot of presentations about the changing nature of work, the impact that the Industrial Revolution 4.0 with robotics, with artificial intelligence and advanced information technology offers. You've heard a lot about the difficulties that in the current situation, that we're moving from a surplus economy to a shortage economy, that we face in developing countries around the world a severe mismatch between supply and demand of labor. You've heard that in order to solve these problems, organizations or government or institutions of education cannot solve these problems alone. 
we need a systems approach and recognizing the interconnectedness of and the need for partnerships to move forward the need for public private partnerships the need for international and global collaboration and global solutions Before we begin to talk about the foundations of a new paradigm, I want to share a somewhat personal perspective. I speak a lot with HRD practitioners, with people in vocational education, with teachers, with administrators, with students. I work with clients in HR and HRD. And I oftentimes ask them a simple question, describe our profession to you. What does it mean to you to be in workforce education, to be in human resource development? And on this concept map, I show you some of the most common results. People invariably talk about the fact that we are proud to add value to organizations, that we're on the cutting edge of organizational practice and performance, that there is a drive for innovation, and excellence, that HRD and workforce education work is holistic, requires a holistic approach to individuals and organizations. I also hear that many times practitioners are not satisfied with the state of affairs. They're doing a wonderful job with the training program, with the organizational change effort, et cetera, but there is a degree of impatience People in our field, I think, always want to do better, want to improve, want to find new ways of helping individuals, helping organizations, helping communities and the nation at large. And this desire, this desire to help, to innovate, uh, comes out of practice. Practitioners realize that the current approach is perhaps not the most um, effective does not work quite as well or does not work all the time. And therefore, a deep need to investigate novel, innovative approaches to working and learning. Well, I want to pose to you that this search for innovation, this search for new ways of connecting people and organizations and societies better is exactly where new paradigms emerge from. New paradigms don't typically come from academics. They don't come from scholars who pour over books. They come from practice, and particularly so in our field that is so deeply engaged in practice. For the past 10 years or so, I've been really interested in a concept called human flourishing. And I hope this translates well into Korean. So flourishing is flowering, is blooming is developing to its fullest. Human flourishing comes out of the field of philosophy and specifically in ethics. And it is one of the primary, the highest goals for individuals. There is, it's difficult to think of a higher goal for individuals than flourishing, than realizing all our potential. Human flourishing is also a key concept in development economics. So two very strong foundations. Human flourishing is an ethical concept. And I want to propose to you that ethics is a key foundation upon which we can develop a new paradigm for working and learning. And this is not just my idea. A, uh, an, an eminent uh, Korean uh, policymaker and very influential person, Dr. Lee John Wook, uh, who had a long and distinguished career in international health and development, and actually uh, led and was the director of the World Health Organization, uh, the WHO, between 2003 and 2008, said that technical excellence and political commitment have no value unless they have an ethically sound purpose, an ethically sound purpose. And again, I want to propose to you that uh, this ethically sound purpose can be found in the idea of human flourishing. The Australian philosopher, John Finnis, defines human flourishing. And he says, human flourishing means well-being 
and living well in matters public and private, economic and social, political and spiritual. So it's a very holistic understanding what it means to thrive as a person, to thrive and flourish as a human being. Interestingly enough, the United Nations has adopted the idea of human flourishing as a fundamental human right, a fundamental human right. So it's not just some philosophical idea or some obscure economic theory. It is being posed as a fundamental human right to live well in body, mind, and spirit. Education and learning have a key part to play in realizing human flourishing. What it means to flourish is me, it means to expand one's capabilities. And capabilities means the potential that we all have in us, the interests, the skills, the aspirations, the hopes, the dreams that we have. These are capabilities. And flourishing or flourishing more means realizing our capabilities, expanding our capabilities. And a key way of doing that, of course, has to do with education and learning, and particularly at work. When we take a little closer look at this notion of human flourishing, which I define as living well in body, mind, and spirit, I lean on, again, on John Finnis's work, who defines seven core dimensions, and you see them listed on the left-hand side. These dimensions come into play when people flourish. What's important is that there is no one size recipe for the relative weighing of these dimensions. So for some of us, um, certain dimensions are more salient, are more important than others at certain stages in their lives. But all of these dimensions are important. Uh, Finnis uses the really nice metaphor, the, the analogy of these dimensions as primary colors. So think of a painter who has a palette, right? A piece of wood where all the paints are located. And he, the painter has seven primary colors. They are the seven dimensions of human flourishing. What does the painter do? The painter mixes the primary colors based on his or her idea, vision of the painting, and then applies the paint to the painting. Similarly, in human flourishing, these dimensions and the combination of these dimensions mean different things for different people. There's no one size fits all. A second key idea behind Finnis's work and the idea of human flourishing is that we cannot do it alone. Human flourishing requires a wider ecosystem. The wider ecosystem are the families, our organizations, the communities, um, the networks that we have, our nation and the globe at large. And just like you would expect from systems theory, you cannot have individual flourishing without also developing well-run, effective, and well-led ecosystems. So the ecosystems, the societal conditions in which we live, predetermine the degree to which human flourishing is possible. Yeah. Likewise, individuals who flourish will be able to contribute to the well-being of the larger systems. They are better leaders, better employees. So the direction is bi-directional. Individual flourishing is dependent on healthy ecosystems and healthy ecosystems depend on uh, human flourishing. Now, the third I think important aspect of human flourishing is the idea that it is by no means an individualistic concept. It is not the Western idea of the person as the arbiter of, of his or her own fate. No. Uh, 
Because human flourishing is a human, a basic human right, we have a responsibility. Each of us has a responsibility for developing the capabilities in ourselves and in others. Yeah. It is not possible to simply be a human, a, a person flourishing without also being responsible for the flourishing of others. And this means the well being of organizations, the well being of our communities, and so on. Yeah. So, this responsibility aspect, I think, is very, very important. Now, I brought several examples, and for the sake of time, I will go through these quickly. All of us and all of you, I would assume, that are involved in workforce education and human resource development can think of the projects that you participate in and think of elements of human flourishing, of enhancing, of broadening the capabilities that a person has in your projects. I listed some of the projects that I've been involved in and some of my graduate students um, on, at the regional level, at the immigration level. And you can see sort of the key idea of expanding human capabilities in each of these projects. We can look at human resource development at the organizational level. A lot of my work has been in nonprofit. So one of my students was concerned with developing the leadership capacity of bishops in a US-based church. I've done a lot of work on higher education leadership in Indonesia, and I've worked a good amount in corporate settings. Women at Abbott is an initiative to help the career advancement of women, again, helping women engineers to realize their capabilities and helping them to flourish. How do we do this? Well, there are several theories, several approaches, and I just want to briefly go through two of them. Uh, my good colleagues, Jay Wojewski and Roger Hill from the University of Georgia, and I believe Roger is presenting at the conference, developed the theory, uh, the concept for school-based vocational education. And you see three pillars, work ethic, innovation, and career awareness. And this preparation for vocation, for career, starts at a very early age. It starts at kindergarten, carries all the way through the end of secondary school and beyond. Another example was proposed uh, and implemented by the United um, States Department of Education. It's called the Necessary Skills for High School Students. And in addition to the academic subject matter, all high school students need to become, become competent in five core competencies. And you see those listed there, interpersonal systems thinking, information acquisition, resource management, technology as well as become fully educated in three basic foundations, basic skills, basic academic skills, thinking skills, and personal qualities. Yeah. So again, a holistic approach. What will it take? Um, paradigm change is never easy, and it's never fast. If you look at the work of Thomas Kuhn, uh, the shift in physics that Kuhn describes in our worldview took place over years and years and years and years. There was resistance to change. The new ideas, the new framework, the new paradigm was thought to be impossible. This will never work here. This is naive. Uh, we cannot change. We are tied to the status quo. So paradigm change is not easy, but I think there are enough indicators, there's enough energy to push forward. How long it will take, I don't know. But it seems clear to educators and HRD professionals alike that the industrial paradigm is no longer sufficient. And as I said before, there is enough experimentation going on at the local level by good HRD practitioners working in organizations, by workforce educators working with students, by adult educators working with different populations. There 
they this level of experimentation eventually will result in a broader shift of thinking about work and learning. And I suppose I, I propose to you that um, human flourishing as an ethical foundation needs to be a core component of this new approach. So in summary, we talked a little bit about the need for a paradigm shift away from the industrial model. Uh, I said that workforce educators and HRD practitioners are already experimenting with novel solutions, oftentimes at the local level. We said that an ethical foundation for the new paradigm can well be the idea of human flourishing. Human flourishing is dependent on well-developed ecosystems and so we talked about the reciprocity between individual development and societal development. We look at some uh, examples from practice, models for school-based education, and I talked a little bit about the barriers and opportunities. I've given you some references uh, of the work that I reference in, in, this, um, in this presentation. And with that, let me close with a, another picture. So this is how central Illinois looks like from the air when you approach by air to Champaign-Urbana. It's very flat, no mountains, not like the wonderful mountain territory in, in Korea. But we say at the university, although we don't have any mountains, we can see a long way in all directions. And so I want to invite you to see with together into all directions to consider what a new paradigm for work and learning can be like. And I look forward to the other presentations and the discussion. I thank you for your attention. Ich bedanke mich für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. And thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, uh, Peter Kuchink. Professor Emeritus Kuchink has talked about the need for us to move on to a new paradigm. And this paradigm shift is from human resources development during the industrial era. And we need to change it to something completely different. And a key concept here is human flourishing. Next, we will move on to Mr. Henry Stewart and his presentation. Um, I'm, this is my second time in Korea, and I'm very honored to be invited and to come to a, a culture and a country that is so vibrant and dynamic. Um, would you like your employees to eagerly look forward to coming to work, to feel fulfilled when they are there, and to, to, to Basically, be happy in the workplace. Yeah? I'm going to give you a few tips on how to create that. Okay. Um, but first, I'll talk a little bit uh, about the pandemic that we've had over the, over the last 18 months or so. Um, the South Korean and the UK response has been very different. Um, on the one hand, uh, in the UK, um, our school students came back to school, but uh, many of our office workers have not been in the office for 18 months or more. I think in, in South Korea it's different, the office workers have come back, but the school students stayed away. Um, and of course, it has um, led to a change in the work environment, in that suddenly people, even quite hierarchical organisations, have discovered that people can be trusted. They can do good work at home. And I think this could make a major change um, as we go forward. Now, oh, that, oh, I did, didn't mention that. that happy, um, I'm from Happy, which is a learning provider based in London. And we were in the best workplace list uh, five years in a row at one point. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about is partly based on our own experience, but partly based on the, on the organizations we met in those lists, people like Google and so on. So, 
in South in your you, in South Korea, you have had less than 3,000 deaths from COVID. I don't know if you know this, but you are seen as an absolute example of good practice in the, in the West, where we have had many more. In the UK, we had 3,000 deaths in just three days, back in April 2020. And the consequence of this was that it completely overwhelmed the health service. I don't think you, you experienced this in South Korea, but in, in, in the UK, in Germany, in the United States, the uh, health service was totally overwhelmed. And that was led to some interesting consequences because our NHS is actually quite hierarchical. You need lots of levels of approval to do things. But when this happened, that all went out of the window. As one doctor put it on Twitter, F the paperwork, F the regulations, just do the right thing. I don't know how that translates, but um, uh, the point being, for once, he didn't have to have lots of levels of approval. He didn't have to get everything written down. He just could do what he knew the patients needed. Um, in another example, uh, this is a hospital in East London that we work with. Um, these nurses told me that in one day, they moved the entire obstetrics department from one ward to another. And again, they, they just did it themselves. Uh, the chief executive tells me that he no longer approves things. His role was just to support. Um, so this is quite interesting in a very hierarchical organisation. And their slogan now is no going back to the old ways. They don't want to go back to, to that, that hierarchy. They want, they've seen that doctors and nurses can be free to make their decisions and to do the right thing. And they want to continue doing that. So I want to, I have a little bit of interaction. Okay, I need your help on this, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask you in a few moments to raise your hands. I want to just ask you to do that now. Can you all raise your hands? Everybody? Raise your hands. Good, good, good. Okay, I want to ask you, um, when have you produced... I want you to think of one specific time when you're really proud of the results that you produced. Okay? Hopefully you've got lots to choose from, but think of one specific occasion when you're really proud of, of something you produced. And let me ask you a couple of questions. Hands up if it was a time when you were really well paid. Anybody? That's, that's nobody at all, okay? Hands up, it was a time when communication from your manager was great. Okay, we're getting, if, do put your hands up if you reckon, got, I only got about 10% there. Hands up if it was a time when you were challenged. Getting a few more there, about, uh, about, about a third or so. And hands up if it was a time when you had freedom and were trusted to make your own decisions. Getting much more there, about 80%. I've asked this question of thousands of people in many different countries. And what enables people to work at their best is being challenged and being given trust and freedom. So, would you like a quick tip on a way to give people trust and freedom? Let me share with you um, what I call pre-approval. So, are you ever asked to go away and solve a problem or come up with a solution and bring it back for approval? Yeah? We all are, aren't we? I'm going to ask that you drop that last step, that the manager approves the solution before you've thought up the solution. Shall I explain that? So, let's, uh, so we had a 19-year-old in our, in our office. She was in charge of the cafe. And the cafe is very important because that is where everybody gets welcomed. Um, we're, we're a learning provider. We provide training courses. And she said, I'd like to improve the cafe. Now, what we didn't do was say, show us a plan and we'll see if we can approve it. What we didn't do was say, let's form a committee to look at it. What we did do was agree the budget, check she understood the values of the organisation, and then left her to decide for herself how she created it. This was the cafe afterwards, which I rather like. It's my, my shirts are kind of modelled on it a bit, in a way. Um, uh, and it fitted the colourful idea of happy. 
I saw it only when she had created it. But imagine how that 19-year-old, three months into her first job, felt walking into her cafe every day. Yeah, can you imagine the pride, the sense, of, the sense of achievement? Now, you might say a cafe is a small thing, so let me share with you um, something from Netflix. Okay, this is Reed Hastings who founded Netflix and he's just written a book about it. And there's a story in there of Jennifer Neve, who when she was at Hewlett Packard, needed a $200,000 consultancy and she had to get 20 levels of approval. It took her weeks. She came to Netflix and in her first three months, she required a £1 million project she, she, she wanted. And she said, who do I get to sign this off? And they said, nobody. Just sign it off yourself. Okay. £1 million with no sign-off from somebody newly formed there. And why? This is what Reed Hastings says. And I'll read it because I think it's very interesting. At most companies, the boss is there to approve or block the decisions of employees. This is a surefire way to limit innovation and slow down growth. When the boss steps out of the role of decision approver, the entire business speeds up and innovation increases. Okay? That's what you get if you stop having to approve things and then put them up the hierarchy. Let me show you another example. Does anybody know David Marquette? Anybody heard of David Marquette? He, as you can probably see, was commander of a US Navy nuclear submarine. And he decided that he would make no decisions. A US Navy submarine is pretty hierarchical. The commander makes all the decisions, right? But he decided that the only decision he would make would be if the missiles were launched, right? That was his responsibility. Everything else, he would just support and coach people. That submarine became the best performing submarine in US Navy history. Because instead of one man deciding what to do, 135 crew members were deciding what to do. You had the intelligence of the crowd. Now, I decided to adopt this at Happy. I decided I would stop making decisions. This was how Happy was looking up to 2017, before I stopped making decisions. Okay? After I stopped making decisions, that's what happened. Because people were taking real ownership. People were deciding for themselves what to do. So let me share, the, I mean, I want to ask you something on this because I'm not necessarily talking about complete freedom. So I want to ask you which of these three that you like. Do you like to be told what to do, complete freedom or freedom within guidelines? So. Who likes being told what to do? That's nobody at all. Oh, one person. One person does like being told what to do. Who likes complete freedom? Complete freedom, anybody? No anarchists in the room? Yeah, a couple of anarchists. Good, okay. And who likes freedom within guidelines? That's, that's again about 90%. That's, so I'm not here talking about giving people complete freedom. People don't want that. People want to have a framework. People want to know what to work within. They want freedom within guidelines. Um, so let me ask you another question. What makes, what do you think? I want you to shout out. What do you think makes people most unhappy at work? Colleagues, says somebody, anybody else? A particular colleague, perhaps? Um, what I think makes people most unhappy at work is the boss, in many cases, okay? Um, people leave, most people, if they leave a company, they tend to leave it because of their boss. Um, in the UK, we found that 48% of the population would take a pay cut to be able to change their boss. Um, and I think you have this, this concept in, uh, you have this concept in career, don't you? Uh, um, that an 84% found, what is it, Cal, Cal, I've got the name, Calpil? What is it again? 
excuse me. Caldium, Caldium, yeah. Um, how many of you have experienced Caldium at any point in your careers? Anybody? That's, a, that's about a third. 84% in the Career Herald said it was a serious problem and 27% have experienced it in the past year. So, let me instead ask you, what do you think are the most important behaviours of managers? What should they be doing? And I'm going to refer you here to a, a piece of research at Google. And Google found, Google, being Google, they looked at the data. They did tens of thousands of pieces, uh, looked at tens of thousands of performance appraisals to work out which were the most important behaviours of managers. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about this because I'm going to ask you for the top two. And it ranges from good communication, especially listening, to expressing interest in your people, down to clear vision. So I'm going to give you 15 seconds to have a think about that. And online, please do think about it as well. Okay, how many think it's good communication? Right, we've got two votes, folks, two votes. That's, that's about 20%. How many thinks it's expressed interest in your people? That's, that's again, about 10%. Be productive results orientated. How many think it's that? That's 10% again. Empower, don't micromanage. That's about half. Help with career development. That's about, that's about half again. Key technical skills. Okay, just the one there. Be a good coach. That's again, just one. Clear vision. Oh, lots of that, about two thirds. Okay, do you want to know the result? In third place was express interest in your people. In second place was empower, don't micromanage. But in first place, the single most important behaviour of managers, and well done to that guy over there, was be a good coach. Okay? Think about that for a moment. How many of you have had a personal coach at any point in your careers? Has anybody had a personal coach? Yeah? Okay. Let me ask you, did they tell you what to do? No. Did they uh, ask you questions? Did they help you find your own solution? That's the role of the coach. That's the role of the manager. Build confidence, ask questions, help people find their own solution. I.e. the role of the manager is not to feel they are the expert. It's not to tell people what to do. It's to step back and coach your people. Yeah? Um, so does this work? Does, do happy workplaces create more profit? You know, we all would like to work in a happy workplace, I'm sure, but are they more effective? Well, Alex Edmonds did an interesting piece of research on this. He looked at the 25 years of best workplace lists and looked at the stock market price to work out if they were more more productive. And he found that if you'd invested in the standard S&P stock market, that's the standard American stock market, and at the end of the period you'd end up with $100,000, if instead you had invested in the best workplace list, you'd have ended up with $236,000. Right? That's the hard financial difference creating a great workplace makes. So I now invest all my pension in happy workplaces, and they're doing very well. Um, there was also this study in the Harvard Business Review and, uh, um, uh, on the value of happiness. Happy workplaces lead to a 37% increase in sales, a 31% increase in productivity, and 300% growth in creativity. Why would you not do it? Why would you not do it? And it's not just in commercial. If we look at... Um, the NHS in the UK. Uh, the King's Fund did a study to look at happy, uh, how happy hospitals, how happy and engaged staff were in hospitals. And you won't be surprised to know that, patient, that if staff are happy, patients are happy. But it's also the case, oh, wrong button, 
that less people die if staff are engaged. For every 96 that died in a happy, engaged hospital, 103 died in a disengaged hospital. That's 5,000 deaths a year in the UK. So it's not inconsequential. Or I like to say 5,000 lives saved by happy hospitals. So if you're sick, make sure you go to a happy hospital because it could make a difference. Okay, these thoughts you'll find in my books. And I've got some free ones to give away. So if you want to come up afterwards, feel free. There's an there's a English version and there's a Korean version um, of it. Uh, because we are uh, looking to pilot our programs in Korea. So if you, oh, and if you're online, go to happy.co.uk, where you'll find an, a free electronic download of the Happy Manifesto. I'm afraid that one's only in English. Um, but also, there's my email if you'd like to get in touch about that, or if you'd like to get in touch about the programmes that we're, we're planning. So would this, would this, this obviously we've done most of our work in, in uh, the UK, but would this work in Korea? Well, this is a CMS Lab, I don't know if any of you know CMS Lab, um, uh, Mr. Lee there. Um, he took on the role of CEO five years ago, and what he was asked to do was make his first priority the happiness of the staff. Now, he had been at LG for 29 years, so this was not a concept that he was especially aware of, you know. Um, but he came on board, he, he, he made his priority the happiness of the staff, and the sales have gone from 9 billion won to 50 billion won in five years, lot from a loss to a profit, and they're now planning an IPO. Entirely based on happy staff. Um, somebody who attended my conference, the conference I, I went to, I spoke at two years ago, was a woman called Ginny in an international bank. And in her bank, at the time, the manager was a bit of a bully. And that manager got fired because she wasn't being productive. Because the thing about, about bullies is it isn't effective. Okay. Um, so she instead, she became manager and she adopted the ideas of the Happy Manifesto, the ideas of trust and freedom. And revenue rocketed. And she stepped out of the way and enabled people to, 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 to do their own thing. Okay. So let me conclude by, by saying... Hangbokan, Chikwon, leads to Hangbokan, Gikwon. No, sorry, Hangbokan, Gogik, <laughs> leads to Hangbokan, Iik. Okay? I'm Henry, I'm happy, I hope you are too. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, that was quite inspiring. You talked of um, happiness. You see the difference. You know, you look at me. I have a I, what I'm wearing a suit and a tie and professor, but Henry, he his outfit just it it just shows happiness, and he's making all of us happy. Now, uh, like to now move to Professor Chang. Yeah. Uh, 연세대 학교 장원섭입니다. Yes, so uh, good morning. I am Chang Wan Sok from Yonsei University. Uh, today I would like to talk about work and learning of co contemporary masters and their masterity. Now, master, we use this uh, word quite often in our daily lives, and this concept had existed for a very long period of time. But we question whether this concept can really work in this day and age. So from a modern perspective, I wanted to revisit this concept of masters. And hence, I started to research into this field of masters. And then whilst I was conducting my research, um, we thought of uh, I came to the notion that just the craftsmanship 
uh, and masterity. There is much more than that. So I wanted to find a concept that could best represent basically uh, what the masters stand for. So I wasn't able to really find a word that would best express the characteristics. So I actually coined a word myself, and that is masterity. I would think that all of, to all of you, this terminology is probably new. In English, if you probably look up English dictionary, there's not going to be any word. Uh, I wasn't able to find an English terminology that would best reflect what I wanted to communicate. So I coined this word myself. I dubbed it masterity. I don't know how this would, could, would be understood, but I would think that the characteristics of the masters is really well embodied in this new word, masterity. So I will take time to explain to you what I mean by masterity and the concept of contemporary masters. I know I only have about two, 20 minutes, uh, but uh, so I have a very challenging task of making you understand uh, what this concept is. Okay, so I just wanted to check how, how uh, the time that uh, I was given. Usually with this topic, I would spend about two hours, but I know I only have 20 minutes. So I would try to make uh, a short presentation as much as possible. So Henry talked about happiness some time ago, a couple of years ago, I saw an article in a newspaper and according to this organization called Uni Universum on the Global Workforce Happiness Index, what they did was they surveyed employees, asking them whether you know, they're satisfied. You will see Korea is ranking at the bottom. Korea ranked 49 in terms of satisfied workers. So why are Korean workers not happy or not satisfied? This was several years ago. Uh, and today we are working 52 hours per week, but around 2016, Korea was working really hard, working long hours. There was very strict hierarchy and vertical organization. So all of these people working in Korea felt that they were not happy at all in their workplaces. Now, there was a very strong trend, and I think this trend is still very meaningful and relevant these days, which is work-life balance. Work-life balance is a, and in Korea, in short, we just call that WLB. But because Korean workers are not very happy at work, and there is even people who, who died of working too hard because of cumulative um, fatigue, people started thinking about reducing the total hours worked so that we could strike a good balance between work and life. So that was a very fresh concept at the time because for human beings, work is not everything in our life. We have our families, we have our society, we have our religion, we need leisure and entertainment. So this whole concept of striking a work-life balance was considered to be a very important. So there was this work-life balance trend that was introduced in Korea. But in my perspective, there were some concerns that I had. Since I'm an academic, I felt that the terminology itself was not appropriately used. One, in Korean, basically is WLB. So this is a balance between work and life. But one cannot distinguish between work and life because while you're working, you're still living. Working is an important part of living. So you can't really have work and life uh, be at the opposite end. This could actually mislead people into thinking that working is not living. We're asleep for about eight hours, and let's say if we're working about eight hours, then half of uh, every 24 hour is dedicated to working. And if we take that work component out of living, then that's a bit misleading. So I think 
the balance has to be between work and non-work balance. That may be a more exact terminology. Now, and also, basic basic assumption is that since you cannot be happy while working, then you that's why you need to find something outside work. And I think it seemed like this terminology was used for that purpose. But as I mentioned, 50% of every day is dedicated to work. And if you cannot find happiness in the 50% of the time, then you're only pursuing 50 per, uh, happiness from the remaining 50% of your life. So that's not going to give us a full happiness. So I think what's important is for us to find meaning even when we're working. We need to find that happiness while we're working. We need to be able to enjoy working and be satisfied in working. So how can we actually achieve that? That was the start of my research. And one of the basis, theoretical basis, is Urebeck, who's a German sociologist. He talked of cappuccino model, and he talked of the relationship between work and leisure. The cappuccino, you have espresso, and then you have this cream. There has to be a good balance in order for this cup of cappuccino to be very tasty. In life, at, at the very center of our life is a very bitter espresso. Sweet cream comes on top. So cappuccino, the crux, the pivot is espresso, the coffee. So work is like espresso. Work is at the backbone of our life. So we cannot get rid of work completely. So what we need to do is, because espresso is very bitter, since all of you probably have work, I think we all have to begin with the assumption that work is bitter. Work is not sweet. So that's, an, that's something that we need to accept. But we can find meaning there because we could enjoy the flavor uh, and the fragrance of that espresso. You can't just eat cream all the time. You can't just eat sweets. So I think what's important is really finding and exploring the meaning of work. How are we going to really enjoy and savor the flavor of espresso and work? So finding a meaningful way to work, I think, would be one of the approach that we could think of. I think I took a step further. I think we're moving to like a cafe latte model working, living, family life, leisure life, everything is now all mixed together. It's all convoluted. Uh, so I think we are now moving to a cafe latte type of a model. Everything is mixed together. So in this environment, how can we really bring a good harmony between work and life, making sure that you could still be happy while you're working? The meaningful work, the reason why I started to, I, I felt that I wanted to really study and research into this field is because of this. You see this slide, this is AlphaGo versus Isador, the goal player. And Isador won only single time against AlphaGo. They had five matches. So all in all, Isador was defeated by AlphaGo. Kerje, the Chinese goal player, wasn't able to win against AlphaGo, not even a single game. So AI, the machine, is now superseded human beings. Now these computers are becoming more intelligent than human beings, not just in physical power. So then what does it mean to be human-like? Charlie Chaplin, in his film Modern Times, you, know, you see how Charlie Chaplin is just a component of a machine. Human beings just provided labor. So we're not an animal, laborians, but we are homo faber, meaning people who's ma who are making something, creating something. Jerry Maguire is a film, and if you've seen it, you would know. Tom Cruise, who's Jerry Maguire, he's a sports agent, and uh, uh, you know, there's a mentor, there's his mentor who said the following, if this is empty, this doesn't matter. That's what the mentor said. And he was, uh, you know, pointing to one's heart. Basically, if your heart is empty, your head, brain is of no use. So when we think about how we are going to work, it's not going to be now based on intelligence, not maximizing rationality because machines could do much better. 
genuineness is important. Our heart is important. Basically, that is something that we need to really delve into as human beings in this day and age. So the contemporary masters, coming back to my topic, it's very bitter, like a cup of espresso. You have to go through hardships. You have to go through difficulties. But these are people who created meaning in the process of working. And they really put their heart out to do whatever it is that they're doing. So from this meaningful masters, I feel that there are values that we can learn from their process. And there are these values that we need to be able to revisit and, and regenerate and recover. So there are a couple of books that I wrote about six years ago. Uh, there is a Birth of Master. And a couple years ago, I published Master again. So just to walk through some of the key aspects of my book, while I was writing this book, I met masters in Korea who are very exemplary. And there were five different areas that I was able to identify. When we think of traditional masters, we think of craftsmen. And out of those uh, craftsmen, there were people who made traditional Korean clothes, porcelain, uh, who, who knitted. And also in the functional uh, aspects, there were Korean masters. And they were actually nationally dubbed. And they were recognized by, by the state. There were people, boiler expert, there were mechanic, car mechanic, there was a person working with a large company uh, making uh, wine, for instance, and making bakeries, or baking, cook. And the other group of people, although they are not dubbed masters, they are considered to be an example in their field, or the role, role models of their domain. And I was able to see that they worked as if they were the master. Ah, like in the, the field of lawyers and uh, physicians, doctors. So, And then there are new uh, occupation areas like IT programmers, uh, sculptors, musical artist, for instance. So there were 15 uh, different cases that I co collated and I researched. I'm, tr I'm continuing to expand uh, the scope of my study and included other people. So in terms of the, the role models and these, each, each of these job domains, I identified people who we could consider to be role models, for instance, salesmen. And secretaries. So all the different occupations. I expanded the scope of the occupation. And in so doing, I was able to identify the common thread that cuts across these experts or masters. Anyhow, looking back at the concept of masters, these were people who were ideal role models for working life. And if you look at these people with these different occupation and jobs, in terms of their social and economic status, there's a quite a divergence. Depending on the type of occupation you have, there's a big difference in terms of income. And the type of work they do is extremely di uh, different. Having said that, they have common denominator. And what that commonality is, the attitude that they have towards their work, their continuous endeavors, that they're always very rigorous and well-disciplined. And so this attitude that they have toward the work that they do had been the same or common. And I define that as masterity. I, I, I don't want to use the word, for instance, craftsmanship. Of course, the outcome of their work is well recognized. The level of proficiency, their skill level is already quite elevated. So it, it cannot be just explained with the terminology of having a, a, a good craftsmanship. Then what is masterity? There are six different aspects. There can be one keyword that cuts across this very concept. The first is growth or development. Now, these people were high performers. 
they were generating high performance, and these were the so-called successful people. Then with regards to how much performance are they bringing, what's the amount of success that they brought, what's more important than that is that they continue to grow. That was the key word. If we look back on their life, these masters may have started that job or work or occupation just by chance. And so they may not have been prepared to do that job, but they had commitment and will to grow and to succeed. And they really had a strong fervor to learn. So for instance, from a apprenticeship, apprenticeship, uh, basically some, you, your teacher teaches you a certain mastery and certain craft. But these individuals, in order to grow more uh, and develop themselves, uh, they would sacrifice sleeping at night. And then there is, of course, a very intense uh, education and training process involved. And also, some of the key characteristics also include that these people, even if it's physical labor, they continuously think, they continuously plan, and there is continuous mind awareness. And even if you are a, not a physical laborer, they would actually move around physically, you know, very actively. Richard Sand talks about thinking hand, thinking hand and working mind. So I think all of those elements played an important role in making these people into masters. Looking closely at the, at, at the way that they were doing, they were emancipating work. To be liberated from work, to be emancipated from work. If you hear this word, sometimes you may, in your mind, think of going on a vacation or going home um, after a day is done. But that's not really a true emancipation. That's just uh, running away temporarily. But emancipating work, uh, liberating, liberating yourself from work is, is not you know, running your own company or running your own shop because there still there is competition and there is more work to be done. To be, and, uh, to be liberated from work is, can, is, can only be possible if you've become a master of that field and domain. If you become a professional, an expert, uh, undisputed, then your manager and, nor your boss could affect you. Even if you run a small shop, if that shop sells high quality product or services, then even if you're a small shop, you could have stronger competitive edge compared to larger companies. So that is what true meaning of liberating from work is. And these are also creative workers, people who worked in craftsmanship, for instance, making hanbok, the Korean traditional clothing. They would try at new things all the time to make something better, to, 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 to sell products that better meet the needs of the customers. There's continuous challenge, and they're continuously engaged in creative working. It's not just about tapping into other or opportunities. This is creativity that is born out of highest level of uh, professionalism and expertise and capabilities and level of skills. They're all focused on providing more meaningful service and product to the people supported by and based on their capabilities. So they continue to learn and they continue to create and so they also expand their horizon of learning. And also at the same time, they also share their learnings. They share their learnings and, 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 and they're, uh, they're generous in giving as well so that they could play an important role in really pro in elevating the community uh, as well as uh, posterity. So here, um, there's peak experience, life at a plateau. So if you're at the peak, this is in line with Maslow's peak experience as well. These people really experience the pinnacle of the experience. So it's like you're under a, a drug, just like runner's high. So there's worker's high as well. 
socially they're well recognized and where they're recognized, they actually experience that peak experience. But their life cannot just be explained with that peak experience because even at high altitude, there's no trees, you know, it's a barren land, but even under a very challenging environment, they continue to reinvent themselves. I don't know whether this analogy would work, but Anna Pruna, this, uh, I, I, I took a trip to go on hiking. It's 300,000 kilometers high. So I suffered, uh, suffered from that high altitude. But I see people who reside there, who inhabited that very high plateau. And so you see this, uh, you, you see this peak valley and you always want to, uh, I guess, hike towards that heights. And so these people, masters, were continuously reinventing themselves. So all of these characteristic, what comes first, what comes later, that's not important. They're a cyclical model. It's a virtual cycle of all of these different elements coming together, affecting one another in developing masterity. So although it may be low level of masterity, but if there is this circular model uh, and you know influence, then we, Based on that, masterity was being formed for these individuals. And in this development process, these individuals would find the happiness that they were seeking and they were able to live a happy life within the work that they were doing. With the age of um, AI, you know, a lot of people are thinking, you know, what's the future for human beings? How do humans live together with machines? This is an inevitable question that we would have to ask. But what's more important is how can human beings continue to develop itself and extract and find meaningful value from the work that they do? I think that's the key. And so metacompetence has become more important in the age of AI. Norbury Hedge has said, ancient futures less than uh, uh, and you know, I t took the idea from that book, and I think that masters has long history and known tradition. So I feel ancient future lessons from masters would shed some light on on the direction forward. Based on masterity of these masters, they continuously develop themselves, and it's not just about fighting based on the details and the numbers. It's more of a genuine heart and meaningful work that's important to develop masterity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. Each speaker has given us at least one important keyword in his presentation, human flourishing, happiness, and master are those three key words. How to achieve the balance between work and life or non-work in the rapidly changing digital era. The key words, human happiness, mastery, and human flourishing. I hope we are a step closer to achieving these ideals. Let's have a big hand once again for our three speakers, including Professor Kuching, who's joining us online. Thank you all very much. Now it's time for our lunch break. After lunch, we will see you back in the next session at 2.20 p.m. Thank you.